Uh, welcome. We are going to be recording this webinar. Uh, so if you are a registrant here or if you, you know, you're listening in, you miss something, you will get an email with the link to this whole recording later. Um, thanks for joining us. I think it's really cool that you're hanging out with us on Valentine's Day morning. We're going to talk all things uh, Roth IRAs today. I'm terrified for this webinar. Like Roth IRAs, like I'm not even really good at that. Like I feel like I was trying to mess around with a Roth IRA in college when I had some like TTA income and I like messed it up. Like I like over contributed or like I did something wrong and I had to file some sort of correction and it was pretty miserable. So straight up, I'm I'm a little nervous about today. <laughs> like, and <laughs> how is this? Yeah. Sam, can, can, can I ask a question? Sam, how is this? How is this romantic? Learning about Roth IRAs. I feel like this wouldn't go over well with my wife. <laughs> oh you know, my I god! Think I think I love. Out. I like love Roth IRAs almost as much as I love my family. Like I'm so excited about this. Oh my god! <laughs> That's a big statement. That's, That's pretty a big deep. statement. Travis, well, you I'm, gave the right uh, right webinar today. I'm I'm, mm -hmm. I'm pretty terrified, so I'm gonna I'm gonna hide and just try to help people in the chat while y'all rock rock it, <laughs> and we'll try to save people some money and save them some stress today, right? Yep. Cool. Well, thank you guys. Thanks for joining. Yes, we are going to be recording this and sending it out later to the registrants. Um, also, you know, I'm super excited that you're joining live today. We'll have a lot of time for Q&A later. So that's a great chance to interact with us with like real questions that you might have or just getting some elaboration on things that weren't super clear. Um, there is a Q&A section that you'll be able to drop your questions into please try to drop the questions in the Q&A section so we can mark which ones we've gotten to by the end of our conversation today. Um, and we'll have a few consultants in the chat just helping out with some questions uh, in the chat and in the Q&A section. But um, I think it looks like the chat is working, but if uh, you wanted to drop your profession in the chat, I'd love to see like who you are. You know, Are you a physician? Are you a PA? Uh, an RN. Where are you coming from? Vet. Awesome. Got Cupid. Saw... Cupid's in the <laughs> house. We have Cupid here. <laughs> Attorney. Oh, sweet. Patients. Chiropractor, oh, naturopath. Process. Sweet. So really great financial planner. Uh -huh. Cool. I was like checking. It's like, is that one of us? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's jump on into it. Yeah, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Oh, yeah, I saw you got a shout out. <laughs> All right. So thanks for joining us again on Valentine's Day. We are super excited for this conversation today. We're going to talk about Roth IRAs. And what kind of prompted this was in our tax webinar a couple weeks ago, we had mentioned somewhere, somebody had mentioned that if we do a filing separate status for student loan purposes, right? Because we talk about that a lot to keep our student loan payments lower. If we filed taxes separately, it was mentioned that we can't contribute directly to a Roth IRA. And our chat blew up with questions about, what? I didn't realize that. Oh my gosh, I've been contributing and I've been filing separately. How do I fix it? So this uh, is definitely something that's... Um, I think very relevant to a lot of our listeners who are definitely doing um, married filing separate for their student loan plan or who have higher incomes that that are not able to directly contribute to a Roth. So we're going to talk about backdoor Roths today, that yucky pro rata rule. You've probably heard pro rata before. And if you haven't, we're going to talk about it uh, a lot today and how we can still love the Roth IRA because it is a pretty cool bucket. Sim's favorite bucket outside of the HSA. Sim, you are in the right profession for <laughs> being nerdy about all these topics. <laughs> We're not even going to think about the HSA today. It's all Roths today. Roth is getting all the love. Mm -hmm. Yep. And um, sorry, we forgot to introduce ourselves. I'm Megan. Uh, we've got Sam and Sim on the call and Travis is in the background. So he'll pop in every so often. Um, but let's jump on into it. So who is the backdoor Roth and why do we love her so much? So we're going to try to keep it to a Valentine's Day theme today, put some funnies in here, make you guys giggle as we have this conversation. Um, so Roth, uh, Roth IRA actually came out, I think in 1998, um, but it, in, in the Roth 401k started coming out around 2006. So I remember hearing about it in high school and it was like everybody's dad thought it was like the coolest thing since sliced bread. Like, oh, have you heard about a Roth IRA? 
So I, I remember like when it started getting popular um, and it's still pretty popular. People still really love it. It's a post-tax retirement savings vehicle. Um, so we don't get a tax deduction, but that means when we put money in, uh, we're, we're taxed on it this year. It's just our income that we put into it. Um, we put money in, it's post-tax. When we take money out in the future for retirement, it's completely tax-free. So that's a pretty cool vehicle because other traditional buckets are taxable when we take money out in retirement. Now, uh, the bucket is not huge. It's 7000 a year for 2024. Last year, the maximum was 6500 So we've got a max of 7000 a year that we can do starting this year. And if you're over age 50, we have another 1000 that you can contribute. <clears throat> Um, there are some income limits to being able to contribute to a Roth IRA directly. So that might be the first um, introduction you may have gotten to a backdoor Roth. Um, so a backdoor Roth, uh, we'll talk about the mechanics here in a bit, but basically it's a way to get around not being able to contribute, right? Because if we can't contribute directly, you might think, at first, like, oh, man, well, I guess that's just not an option. Well, it is. There's there's a backdoor way around this this equation. So um, if we make too much, uh, then so single, there's a phase out period between 146,000 and 161,000. If we're within that range of income, um, then w there's a phase out period where we, we just it reduces how much we can contribute over the course of the year. So not 7000, but maybe something a little less. If we're over the 161,000, we can't contribute directly at all. So in comes the backdoor Roth um, part of the conversation. Now filing jointly, there's a larger phase out, 230,000 to 240,000. But if we're over 240,000 together filing jointly, we can't contribute directly to the Roth. And then married filing separate phase out is very small. So zero to 10,000. If we're filing taxes separately for student loan purposes, this is why we can't directly contribute to a Roth, even if we don't, you know, even if we're under the the original like um, 240 limit uh, or uh, 161 for a single person, it's because the married filing separate phase out is so small. Um, this is where the backdoor Roth can come in as well. And so backdoor refers to a process, the process to be able to contribute. It's not actually an account type. So if you go to a custodian and you want to open an account, you're not going to open a backdoor Roth. You're going to be opening a Roth IRA still, but the process of being able to contribute to that account is what the backdoor Roth is. Hey, Megan, real so, quick, I'm just going to interrupt. Yeah. We're getting a lot of questions in chat. If you have a question, please drop it in Q&A so we can try to answer everybody's question. It'll make it a lot more likely we can get to your question if you drop it in the Q&A. Thank you. Yep. And we'll have some time. Well, I think we'll have a little bit of time towards the end where we'll, we'll be able yeah. to talk through a lot of your questions. So, but thanks for participating, guys. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so steps to courting or completing a backdoor Roth. Um, so there's a couple of steps that we have to take. And uh, I think a lot of people know this already, but let's go through and review like the steps specifically to be able to do a backdoor Roth. So first, let's make sure we have an open Roth IRA and an IRA. Actually, we also need an IRA open as well. So you'd have two accounts, a Roth IRA and an IRA, ideally at the same company. <clears throat> Second is we have to make a non-deductible contribution to a, a traditional IRA. So non-deductible just means that, you know, when you think traditional IRA, you might think that there's some kind of tax deduction associated with it, but this uh, would not be tax deductible if we're doing this backdoor Roth. Um, it's really, we're using the traditional IRA as a placeholder, I guess you could say, like a one-stop shop for being able, or not one-stop shop, but like the first stop of our journey here to be able to, to convert into the Roth. So we make a, so step two is make a non-deductible contribution to a traditional IRA. You could do the annual amount all in one fell swoop if you want. Um, a lot of times uh, administratively, that's probably the, the easiest way to go about it. Or else if you make monthly contributions, you'd probably want to, con you know, uh, make a con contribution and then do step three, which is transfer it to the back door or to the Roth, I mean, um, right afterwards. So step three is transferring the IRA contribution into the Roth as soon as possible. Don't forget about the courtship, guys. <laughs> We've got to commit to this uh, Roth IRA conversion. 
So you want to do it as soon as possible because if there's any uh, growth on what happens within the IRA, um, there's some tax consequences there. So you just want to do it ASAP and you don't want to forget about it. That's the other thing. Like you might make a contribution and then completely forget about it until next year and you're thinking, oh no, I, I forgot to make the conversion. And so there might be some issues there with that. Um, number four is don't forget to invest the Roth IRA funds. Um, oh, there was a hilarious like meme that went around a long time ago. I'm a millennial. So of course, like we speak and meme talk um, and reels or, t you know, reels because we're millennial millennials, not TikTok. Um, but there was one where it was, you know, a picture of a plane, like visualize a plane with like the stairs leading up to it. You know, we're, we have the plane, which is the vehicle, like the, the Roth IRA. We're loading the people up onto it. That was the next picture. So we're putting money into it. And then it kind of alludes to the fact that you forgot to take off, right? You forgot to invest it. Like, don't, don't forget to invest the money. Don't leave it in cash. Um, and then the last step here is to report the conversion on your taxes. There's a couple tax forms that you have to um, complete or have as part of your tax filing. So the 8606 form, the 1099R form, you need those receipts, guys. So we'll talk a little bit more about those uh, tax details here towards the end. Um, but anything you'd like to add to that, Sam? I saw you laughing at my, <laughs> I don't know what joke, <laughs> what lame joke. Oh, you the, just that we're millennials. We don't do TikTok. <laughs> and I was like, that is so right. true. I felt like I felt so seen by that comment. <laughs> <laughs> Um, cool. one, one thing to add here, though, about the non-deductible contribution, right? So what that means is if you just make a, if you're someone who's just contributed to a traditional IRA and you're going to make it, the, it's, you know, it's a, and you meet the qualifications for it, it's deductible and you would normally go on, when you do your tax return, you would make a deduction for it, right? Lowering your, uh, you know, getting a lower uh, AGI. But in this case, it's not, you're, you wouldn't take that deduction. So it's not necessarily like you have to do something extra to make it a non-deductible contribution. You're in fact, you're just not taking that extra step. Mm -hmm. Yep. 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 So let's, uh, let's talk about what can go wrong with this relationship, right? What can go wrong here? So I'll throw it over to you, Sam. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say, right. You know, what can go wrong in this relationship, right. Drive it off course, you know, when you're on this court, uh, courtship, as uh, Megan would say, um, is that, you know, I would say the, one of the more important tax implications to be aware of is the pro rata rule. Um, I would say most mistakes over time, commonly happen here. Um, and it's more just for lack of information or the person you're working with has lack of information there, right? And this is where we're gonna tie in some tax forms a little bit. And I'm, this is where uh, Sim is gonna get down and dirty later uh, to get more into to the weeds here because she loves this personally to talk about. Um, is that when you report, you know, when, going back to reporting, right? When you report a Roth IRA com, you know, conversion on an IRS form 8606, you know, there is a pro rata calculation made right? The, num uh, the numerator is going to be the amount converted. And then the denominator is the total amount of all IRAs, kind of uh, not necessarily like employer plans or Roth IRAs, um, but all other IRAs. Um, so it's important, you know, that you report these contributions and also conversions on your tax return, that form, right? That is what uh, that form 8606 is supposed to do. It gets it on the record. Um, but some of the actions you take affect that, right? So moving on from that, right? Uh, I think kind of going in order here, there's different issues that we see that come up, right? The first one is maybe you don't convert within the same cal calendar year. I would say out of all of the mistakes, this might not be the worst. It's, it's, it's inconvenient, right? And not clear, um, uh, or it can make it less simple for the process, right? Like if you made your 2023 IRA contribution in April 20. For, right, instead of reporting both the contribution and the conversion on your 2023 taxes, you would report only the contribution there, right? Um, but I would say um, the one that we were talking about just previously, right, the timing issue, right, interest accrues on the IRA before being converted. So it's, we talked about being pretty quick, not dilly dallying uh, or, you know, keeping it, you know, uh, having the account already open. Because if you make that non-deductible contribution and you immediately convert it, convert it, it is not a taxable event at all, right? Uh, especially if you keep it in cash and move it right over. But if you keep it there, especially when, you know, maybe cat, like if you're in a money market fund that's earning a little interest or you accidentally invest it, right? They can have some earnings on it. And when you go to convert whatever, that growth, right? Those earnings could be taxable in that current year. Um, 
And then finally, uh, we touched on this very beginning, right? Uh, maybe making a contribution when you're not supposed to, right? Uh, because maybe if you file jointly, uh, you're um, over the threshold or commonly a lot of people, you know, realize that for student loan purposes, they need to file separately. And that really pretty much eliminates a lot of the population from making, being able to make a Roth IRA contribution in the previous year. And so that's where the recharacterization issue <laughs> comes into play. And that needs to be done before specific tax filing deadlines, depending on when you did it. Um, and so that is why it's important sometimes to really know before you make the contribution, what your tax filing status is potentially going to be, what is the family's income. And that's actually why um, sometimes there are deadlines that are up to the tax filing. So you understand more about what contributions you can make, what conversions you can make and stuff like that. Um, but I think I want to point this out. This, I don't want to get too much into the rata, but is there any, uh, Megan, and did you guys want to talk any more on any of these issues? I'm going to dive right into that next. <laughs> I know. I've been waiting, like chopping at the bit here. So first, you want to jump in? I'm just, yeah. I'm just so impressed that at nine o'clock in the morning you use both the words numerator and denominator. I'm, I'm in awe of you. So, <laughs> no, my grandma, you know, my grandmother was a CPA, right? I, it's just in my blood. <laughs> so, who is this prorata character, and why do I have to fear her? So, continuing with our Valentine's Day story, she's the home wrecker in our story. She is taking what would normally be a tax-free and to us simple event and making it partially taxable. And I just realized if we're going to call her the home wrecker, I don't know if I want my nickname to continue to be the pro rata queen <laughs> around here. So here's what happens, okay? The IRS is going to look at all of your IRAs, whatever IRAs you may have, and the balance as of December 31st. So if you have a rollover IRA, a SEP IRA, a simple IRA, and the Roth, they're going to look at all as one big balance, and then you're going to pay a proportionate amount of taxes on the conversion relative to how much pre-tax money you had in this big bucket. So here's an example. You broke up with your old employer. You said, I'm leaving you and I'm going, to, I'm going somewhere else and I'm taking my 401k with me, right? And so you took your 401k with you and you rolled it into a rollover IRA and it was 43,500. Then you decided, you know what? I still haven't done my backdoor Roth for 2023. So that's 6,500. So uh, let's do some math, okay? I kind of laid it out for you here. So your total balance, all of these accounts together, $50,000. The pre-tax amount, that was your old 401k. It's not a 401k anymore. It's your rollover IRA, 43,500. Your 2023 max for last year for the backdoor Roth is 6,500. So that's where we got the 50,000 from. So let's say you do this conversion. 6,500 is 13% of the whole balance. It's 50,000. That is the portion that's tax-free, which means the rest of that conversion is taxable. That's 87%. So you take 87% of the amount that you converted. That's the 6,500. You're left with 5,655. This is the portion of the conversion that is taxable. That's why they call it the pro rata rule. They are prorating the amount of tax you pay. How much tax do you pay? It's going to be whatever your tax bracket is, your tax rate. So if you're in the 37% tax bracket, you're going to pay 37% of the conversion in tax. Ouch. Here's the other thing. This is the other annoying part about the pro rata rule. She does not save her receipts. And so if you pay taxes on it, these are technically taxes you would have paid eventually in your 70s, right? You would have been taking RMDs or something and paying taxes on it. You're just paying it now. And we don't really want to pay it now. We think maybe our taxes are going to drop later. But you're paying your taxes now. That's called basis. You need to keep track of that. Your CPA is not going to do it. Form 8606. Yep. <laughs> you got to keep track of that. Whatever taxes you pay, if you don't, it's not a big deal. You're not going to get in trouble. But it means you'll end up paying taxes again on that same amount in your retirement. And so if you don't want to pay taxes on something twice, you have to keep track of it. Mm -hmm. And to back up to like, I think where this might resonate with a lot of people is um, when you're doing a backdoor Roth, right? Like you, you aren't anticipating an extra tax bill and this can create an extra tax bill for you in that year that you didn't expect. Um, so while it might not be a huge amount, it's still like a couple thousand potentially, depending on how much your, your, um, you know, your percentage is, um, that, that could be in your tax, uh, filing for this upcoming year. So this is why this, this topic is so important. The pro rata rule is something that we have to pay attention to. The good news is if you left your old 401k in the 401k shell, the, it, the pro rata rule doesn't come into play. It's only if you rolled it into an IRA, like a rollover, an IRA, for example, 
Um, so if it's still in like that 401k shell, we're okay. But if we have any outstanding IRA balances, that's when this pro rata rule comes into play and we're going to be paying taxes when we may logically think that we're not because we, you know, we thought we were just doing a backdoor Roth, right? To be fair, like over, you know, having a small amount, it's not the end of the world, right? Like if you had like maybe like a $1,000, $2,000 rollover that's just sitting there, but like you said, over time, if, you know, the both both situations continue to grow, whether it's the non-Roth IRA balances plus your continued conversion over time, it just gets a little bit more complicated administratively, but also less tax advantages. So we're going to talk more solutions now, I think. Yes. Let's yeah. Solutions. We're not going to just be all doom and gloom. We're going to actually so, show you the, show you the we, love of how to fix it. How do we deal with this little home wrecker on Valentine's Day? How do we fix it? So you can avoid it in the first place. I called her a wench. I thought it was so funny. You can avoid the pro rata wench by like what Megan said, just leave the four 401k alone. So you can still break up with your employer. Most of the time, there's no issue with leaving your 401k or 403b where it is. There are a few exceptions. Some employers, if the balance is really small, like less than 5,000, they may force you to move it, but mm -hmm. otherwise you can keep it where it is. And by the way, 401ks and 403bs do come with like certain protections and that's kind of outside the scope of our talk today, but um, there are a lot of good reasons to, to keeping it where it is. The only downside I can think of is you may have some record keeping fees um, that they didn't charge you while you were an employee, but for keeping it there, right? But that's one option to avoid the whole headache. Let's say that you already moved it out though. Now you have these IRAs. You can do what's called a reverse rollover. So rolling the traditional or rollover IRA, or even if it's like a SEP, like whatever the, the pre-tax IRA is, you can move it to a workplace account. The 401k or 403b, we call this exploring your options on Valentine's Day. About 70% of 401ks and 403bs do accept rollovers. So this for a lot of people is a solution. This is a tax-free event too, moving from pre-tax to pre-tax. If you have 1099 income, so you're self-employed, right? Maybe you're a sole prop or something. You have some side hustle. You're doing locums. You don't have any employees. You can open an account called a solo 401k, which is actually another account that I love, but we're going to kind of focus on Roth getting all our <laughs> love today. But you can open a solo 401k, which is a 401k for a self-employed individual. You can roll the IRAs into it. What's great about solo Ks is that because you're opening it and you can open it wherever you want, you get to set the rules. So you can allow for rollovers in the plan that you create. We call this opening up the relationship. So now you're opening up to another account type. If your IRA is small, so maybe you had to move the account out. Maybe it was like $5,000. You had to roll it out. This could be a case where strategically we do decide to convert the whole thing to a Roth, even if you're going to pay some taxes on that. This is potentially a great idea for someone who maybe maybe just finished residency. So you're, you're in a low tax bracket and you know next year you're going to get that sweet attending salary. So you're going to be a much higher tax bracket. This is the time to maybe do the conversion. And now for the rest of your career, that money is going to grow tax-free. And a lot of cases, just because I love after-tax money so much, I have recommended a lot of people do that strategy and if you're in a lower tax bracket. So this is making the mm -hmm. emotional commitment to the Roth. You guys were doing it. Yeah. And that doesn't count against the limit. I saw a couple of questions coming through about that. Like converting this $5,000 doesn't count against your $7,000, right? For the Correct. year. Mm -hmm. They're two separate things. So your contribution is a totally separate amount. And if you did make a mistake, right, maybe you ended up contributing to your Roth. You didn't know that you were going to be above the AGI limitations. You didn't know you were going to file separately because you didn't do your student loan plan yet. You have to do what's called a recharacterization. And um, you can just call your custodian. It's it's really just a form. It's not as scary as it sounds. But this is how you repair your relationship with the Roth if you made a contribution that you weren't supposed to. Mm -hmm. Like recharacterizations yep. have gotten like a lot easier over the years. It used to be like kind of like a paperwork nuisance, but you know, it, most custodians have an easy, simple, seamless process. It just needs to be done before the tax uh, tax deadline. And just to mm -hmm. uh, clarify too, what we mean by recharacterization. So you made a contribution and went into the Roth. You weren't supposed to, they're going to take it, pull the whole thing out and put it in your traditional IRA. And then you're going to go back and convert it. So if that sounds stupid mm -hmm. to you, that's because it is, but th these are the rules <laughs> that we have to work with. Um, call your congressperson. Right. Yeah. And this this would definitely be relevant to someone who for 2023 is deciding to file taxes separately, for example. Um, this is a common example that I see where we're having to do a recharacterization because they didn't realize, oh, I didn't realize I was going to be filing 2023 separate. So I am like I made way more than ten thousand dollars. Right. Because that's the limit for married filing separate. Um, 
I'm going to have to fix what I did last year. So I made a contribution to the Roth. I need to fix it. So that's how you can fix it. You can recharacterize it, which just means moving it over to the IRA, and then you can convert it back to the Roth. So it, it is silly, but backdoor Roth, this is what, what we're faced with. And it's okay to ask <laughs> for help the too, fight. On the, in these cases too, right? Yeah. Like, you know, that's, that's just something that we work with our clients a lot with on, on, especially during this, you know, especially since we usually recommend file separate and then we have to help them with yeah. the organizations. Yeah. So let's talk about that. I know we threw out like a lot of uh, probably technical terms. Uh, we tried to make things sexy. They're probably still not super sexy, but <laughs> we can definitely help if you're, if you're feeling like your head is going to explode. Um, the Roth IRA is still a great bucket to contribute to. There's just all these little technicalities that we have to pay attention to. And if you don't care to pay attention to those little technicalities, you just want someone to help you figure out what you should do, when you should do it and how to do it, you know, then definitely take a look at us. So SLP wealth, uh, we could be your match made in heaven guys. Uh, if you need some help with this, if you, um, you know, have been a do it yourselfer, but now you're realizing, ah, I just don't have the time for it. Um, we help educated people like you avoid these huge money mistakes. So we we see this a lot, even in our student loan consultations. We'll see this. We'll, we'll pick up like, hey, did you file? You know, are we filing separately? Yes. Did you do a Roth IRA last year? You know, we're picking these things up in the student loan consultation. But this is something that we can actively and proactively help you do correctly on an ongoing basis. So we can avoid these mistakes and having to go back and like fix these things. And Megan, um, I just want to call out too, because we saw people dropping their professions. We offer profession specific planning. I saw a lot of physicians, dentists, vets. We have a group for you. Um, I'm actually the head of our physician planning group and Sam. Yes, yeah, I, um, I am actually uh, the head of uh, the nursing, but also uh, more into the nonprofit to world. So think education and medical. Mm hmm. And you could take us home to mother, guys. We're all uh, highly educated uh, professionals. We're CFPs, CFPs. Phase, CSLPs, CHFCs. Um, so we're, of course, we're nerdy about this. Um, a sim can never hide it. <laughs> I love and, uh, our, financial, we also our financial alphabet soup. Like I'm so proud of it. We have so much education experience across everyone. Yeah. And of course we're highly like focused in on the student loan stuff as well. Like we're very student loan aware, of course, because that's where we, you know, initially started. Um, we have a tax team as well, if you're into that. If you need some help with taxes, uh, especially if we have to do some corrections, we have a tax team that's also student loan aware. So if we're doing married separate, if you're in a community property state, you're struggling to find a tax preparer that understands why you're trying to do married separate for student loan purposes, then, you know, consider working with us um, on the financial planning side. And then that allows you to, to work with us on the tax side as well. Um, so. I think we covered quite a bit. Um, let's go back and talk about some of the questions that came through, though, because I think that can really drill down onto some of the topics that we chatted about today. Um, one of this, the questions that I saw, though, was about the phase outs. So I'll just put this back up on the screen for a second. Um, so there's an there's two kind of components to why you might need to be considering doing a backdoor Roth if you're wanting to contribute to a Roth IRA in the first place. Um, so there's a phase out from an income perspective where we can't contribute directly to a Roth IRA if we make more than a certain amount. These are the phase out limits. So for single, not married, this is where we're at. If you're between 146,000 and 161,000 of income, you're not going to be able to contribute the max, the 7,000. It's going to be a smaller amount. Um, but if we're over 161,000 single, we're not going to be able to contribute directly to the Roth IRA. The phase out for married filing jointly, if we're filing taxes married jointly, uh, is 230 to 240. If we're over 240 together, we cannot contribute directly to a Roth IRA. Insert the backdoor Roth here. And if we file separately, which a lot of our, our folks are doing for student loan purposes, it's very unlikely you are making less than 10,000. So you are probably going to have to be, yeah. Have you guys have a, I don't think I have a client that meets this, this or come across someone recently that can actually meet this phase. Not out, a so. professional client. Yeah, Maybe yeah. we do have some stay, stay at home parents yeah. that might fall into this category, but, um, I want to it's comment still... too on the phase out. If you're in the phase out, it's probably just worth it to do the backdoor Roth as opposed to figuring out, okay, I can do mm -hmm. 2000 into the Roth directly and then I have to do 5000 backdoor Roth, like just backdoor the whole thing. So it's one, yeah. one event. Mm -hmm. and when they that was one big question. 
but just to kind of repeat because i am seeing questions come through like there's the word con contribution that megan has been reviewing right now but then the conversion right the conversion doesn't have a dollar limit but it does have a tax implication potentially uh imposed on it depending if you're not doing it with the timing issue right so just you know just make sure that like when you're doing the backdoor raw there the conversion actually doesn't have a limit but there could be different implications if it's not done correctly which we reviewed today right um mm -hmm. but it's the contribution that these phase outs um, that we're talking about right now. Another yep. question that came in was, can you contribute to both a traditional IRA and the Roth IRA? So technically, yes, across both though, you can only do the 7,000. And so typically what you'd wanna do is pick your strategy and stick with it. Are you going for a pre-tax deduction if you're eligible, which um, a lot of you might not be, there's some some rules around that with a traditional IRA, or do you wanna do the backdoor Roth and get that sweet after-tax growth? So usually you kind of pick one and stick with it, but just know 7,000 is across both. So you can't do 7,000 into your traditional and then 7,000 into your Roth. And you know, I do wanna be mindful that we have a lot of professionals here carrying potentially six figure debt, which is we, is normalized, right? But so we wanna be careful about saying like the Roth IRA is great. It's queen of everything, right? Tax-free money and <laughs> retirement. But one thing we're mindful of as, especially in our practice is that should you be making other types of contributions, right? We would love Roth IRAs and the diversity of taxable, different taxable income or non-taxable income in retirement. But whether you should do it is gonna be very personalized and individualized. And so that's why make, connecting with someone who knows more about your situation instead of on a general level can be useful. Mm -hmm. We do have the booking link in the chat, um, but also this is a QR code you could pull it up with if you would like to schedule a meeting with us. If you've already done a student loan consultation with us, our financial planning is just 99 a month if you'd like to join and we can help you with this. Um, if you have not done a student loan consultation with us, this link will take you to book that first. That's um, kind of the introduction to working with us overall. A lot of your financial planning can stem from what we do with your student loans. So it is really important to start there. So we know how to tackle that big elephant in the room, right? Then we could start to move on to other financial planning conversations, other goals that you have, like the backdoor Roth. Um, so use this link if you would like to work with us. Um, it'll direct you to your profession specific group. So uh, like, like Sim said, we have a physician specific group. We have a dental uh, specific group. Um, we have the nonprofit space and uh, nurses too. Uh, nurses too. Yep. As I say, Sam's part of that. Hey, Megan, can I just vector. comment too? That mm -hmm. 99 a month, you guys, is a really big deal because no one else is offering that. If you kind of were to shop around, you're probably going to be looking at five to 10,000 a year just to access a financial planner who might not even know about the student loan piece, who might not even know about the forms you need if you're doing filing separately in a community property state. So we're, I don't want to say we're like the cheapest game on the block because we're really good at what we do. We're efficient, we're tech forward, and that's why we can charge what we do, but we won't always be able to charge 99 a month. And so if you want to get in on that pricing book today, if you don't have a student loan plan, we'll get you set up first at a really good discount, and then we'll take care of your financial planning. So use our QR code slplwealth.com slash book. I was going to say swipe left, but I realized <laughs> I don't know if that's left or right. I have never been on Tinder. You guys, I've been married for I think, nine I years. I think it's so. like, uh, swipe right. I just know that. Swipe right. right. Swipe right. Um, is, is the good, okay. But yes. I would say, you know, also, you know, I think Sim and Megan can talk about this too. It's like, you know, traditional financial planning is probably, you know, you might meet with a planner that charges you $1,300, $1,500 up front, meets with you for an hour, delivers a plan over another hour, and then that's your plan for the next 20 years. You know, with our clients, we typically can sometimes meet with them up to, especially in the first year, you know, four times a year, right? Maybe five if we're really focusing in one area uh, because we're working with you throughout the year on your, uh, you know, financial priorities. And we like to have fun. We're not your yeah. granddad's financial planner. We make inappropriate jokes on <laughs> Valentine's <laughs> day. Like we know our stuff, but we're also not super buttoned up either. So we, we, hey, uh, love what we do. Hey, Sam, speaking of, of making inappropriate jokes. Um, so you know how like you might have one squeeze, which is the Roth IRA, and then another one comes along and might change your life and might be a better option for you. Right. Okay. So I was working on some spreadsheets while y'all were talking just for fun, funsies. Um, by the way, in the QA, if you want to ask a question to, to folks, put your question in the QA. Um, if y'all are down, if 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 I could have maybe like five minutes while y'all just like go into the breach of the QA where we're getting inundated mm -hmm. with questions, sure, um, sure. which would be wonderful to tackle those. And then I wanted to talk about why. I'm going to just play devil's advocate for a moment and say why there might be a more spicy option for people than just the Roth IRA. I'm going to play a little devil's advocate and see what you think. <laughs> see if things think I'm off base here. But yeah, we definitely could uh, use some help in the Q&A because I've been trying to uh, 
parry the many arrows and we want to get all the arrows answered. <laughs> um, sure. So, uh, so you want to share sh your screen? Yeah, I'll share my screen. Uh, so let's see here okay. if I can share it. Uh, let's see. I, I think I got to get permission if you want to give me permission to share screen still. Um, oh, yeah. You I may just, have my permission. Let me I find just noticed it. Travis has the real Travis. I uh, love that Travis asked for consent. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, Valentine's it's, Day, yes. It's important. Yes. To, it's important. To, oh gosh. On all gonna, days, actually. I'm gonna. Yeah, all days. Gonna, Thank you, Sam. <laughs> all right. So, uh, all right. So here's so here's this little fun uh, spreadsheet that I was playing around with. So just to show, first of all, the importance of a back to Roth. Like, why fool with this at all, right? Like, why is this? I'm gonna I'm gonna actually take Sam and Megan's side first and say why is this the best thing since like sliced bread. Well, if you put in your yearly contribution for your Roth, which, you know, they tend to like increase it over time. It's not going to be exactly this, right? But they tend to increase it like, right, like 500, you know, every other other year or something like that. So I'm assuming that they increase the Roth IRA contribution over time. And then right here in this first column, I'm looking at like the growth over time of the Roth. So I'm just kind of assuming like a 7% rate of return. And then I'm assuming you just consistently do it every single year. And I'm assuming this is just for like one person, right? Um, so if you're, you know, in a long-term relationship, double is good, right? So if you have this like tax-free growth, you're not getting taxed on the dividends because it's tax-free growth. And so that's compounding at that 7% return without what we call a tax drag. So a tax drag is when, you know, the IRS takes a percentage of your dividend income, you know, every year, which for the S&P, what is the latest yield on that? Maybe like two or 3%, right? So if you're in like a, you know, 20% federal bracket, uh, five percent state, you're losing like a quarter of your dividend income every year, and you're not losing money on your unrealized gains. But that's like getting into the weeds too much. So basically, you end up with about like 1.8 million in this hypothetical example. Now, if you compare that to putting the exact same amount of money in a brokerage account, mm -hmm. you do get hit with a tax drag. Is there an easy way to describe tax drag, Sam? Like, how would you just how would you describe tax drag? It sounds like. Yeah. Uh, it like sounds a, like a drag just to think about this. I don't I know. know, right? Like a partner holding a, you back. A partner holding you back, right? Like Thank the you, Sam. annoying, like uh, what I, I think my wife calls it, like energy vampire or something. There's like some Hulu show that that's like a funny thing in. So, Vibe like, suck. But, yeah, exactly. So, so basically, if you're in the brokerage account, you're not going to be getting the seven percent return right here, which I'm going to try to bold there. You're not getting that seven percent return because you're having some of your lost uh, dividend income to taxes. Right. So if you're only losing like a small amount of that dividend income to taxes, then maybe that instead of 7%, maybe you're actually earning like 6.25 or something like that. And so that's compounding at like a, at a slower rate in a brokerage account compared to a Roth IRA. So if you end up with the final result here after like, you know, 20 ish years, you're looking at um, or 30 ish years, you're looking at like 1.8 versus 1.5. So that's like the actual account balance. And of course, when you pull the money out to actually use it, then you're going to have uh, a big difference in um, in actual take home pay, right? Because the Roth, you pull it out tax free, all the earnings are tax free, whereas the brokerage account, you have to pay taxes on the gains. So you've got to pay, you know, state and federal income tax on the gains. So you know, in this hypothetical example, I'm calculating about a six hundred thousand dollar difference in the actual money you can use in retirement from doing the back to Roth versus the brokerage. Now, the reason why I was going to um, play devil's advocate and say, you know, do you have better options out there in the dating market? Are there potentially better choices that you could make? So the pre-tax 401k, you're taking the deduction up front, but you can put a lot more in, right? So this is the 401k contribution I'm assuming, which is like kind of triple the amount for the Roth. And sure enough, you end up with about triple the amount of money at the end because you're putting in three times the amount of money. You're also taking like that deduction up front, which if you're in a moderate federal income tax bracket with state and IDR payments, you know, you're saving uh, 24,000, but it's probably only costing you like a half of that to a two thirds of that. So it's like way less of a drag, way less of a vibe suck. That relationship is way more effortless. You know, you just, you know, you don't even have to like work at the communication. You just, it just flows, right? This is, I'm not nearly as good as being funny as you guys, but like, so like that's the so that so you end up with all this extra money. Now the thing I didn't show is you know, now you have to pay ordinary income tax on the withdrawals, right? But like you can plan for that like really well by like pulling money out, you know, like at a uh, like just by doing tax planning, right? Like optimizing tax brackets and things like that. And then if you do brokerage account too, you also have more money than the Roth, but not because you, it's the Roth isn't better. It's because it's just because you're putting like more into it. 
So I, I guess like, I think I'm going to get in trouble if I keep making analogies. So I'll just stop. But I just thought I would kind of show like in an ideal world, like the Roth IRA is like, I really should say this. It's like a successful part of a polyamorous relationship. <laughs> like you want, you want the Roth, you want the pre-tax 401k, <laughs> right? Like you want the brokerage, like you want it all working together. You don't want, in this case, to have it be the only game in town. So but I'm going to restate, Travis, what you're explaining to the folks. So this is called a three bucket strategy for retirement. If you've met with me, we've talked about this a lot. Part of a successful retirement portfolio is you have three buckets of money to pull from, pre-tax, after-tax, and taxable. But like Travis said with the pre-tax, there's a lot more money you can put into there. And if I put on like my tinfoil hat, they don't let you put as much into the Roth because the government wants you to pay taxes eventually. And so that's why I really, again, I love Roths. I really covet that after-tax money in your portfolio. So if you're in a position where you can contribute to all three, your 401k, do the backdoor Roth, and then some money in your taxable brokerage account, I think that's a triple win. But it's true that cash flow can be you know, sensitive and we need to be mindful of how much money we have. And so sometimes you do need to prioritize which buckets you're contributing into. There's no rule. There's no like you should like everyone should do the same thing. It's very um, customizable. And so that's why you need to actually do some planning and figure out what makes sense for you. Um. Can I touch on two points uh, real quick? Uh, one, and then I'm actually gonna, for my second point, I'm going to call up Travis because I think he'll do the best job at this. Um, it's going to be really investment related. So put that hat on. Um, but the first one is talking about SEP IRA versus solo one four okays, right? So I think, you know, we have a lot, I'm seeing in the chat, I'm doing my best, Travis. Um, the Q&A is to, you know, seeing a lot of people who have SEP IRAs who want to continue to continue to uh, contribute to SEP IRAs. And to be fair, five, 10 years ago, the conversation between SEP IRA and solo 401ks was a lot harder because of the complicated, it was used to be super complicated and administratively annoying to open a solo 401k. Uh, but now with just certain changes, uh, it's just more accessible to people, solo 401ks, right? And so if you are someone who's considering the backdoor strategy long-term, right? And continuing to do this over time, the solo 401k is gonna be a better bet to think about, especially if you are continuing to earn that self-employment income, right? Um, can I say Can I say another yeah. terrible analogy though? Yeah, go it's ahead. Okay. So like a solo 401k is like that, like love of your life. That's like so beautiful and like you want to give everything to but they could also it could also absolutely end you and leave you in shambles like heartbroken like with nothing at the side of the street corner and the reason i say that is there's a new change in secure 2.0 that i found out about personally where uh, if you have more than 250,000 in a solo 401k mm -hmm. then you have to report the solo 401k <laughs> balance a certain way a very specific certain mm -hmm. way and if you don't, there's a fine of $250 per day. So if you find out about that reporting error, uh, like like after a while after you file something, ask me how my own burn. That's, I feel like that's some personal trauma. That's some personal relationship trauma going on there. I just um, feel like Travis didn't read the terms and conditions of the relationship and he got burned. There's but a so reason why I hired SLP Wealth. <laughs> because I realized that like not even I can pay attention to all of the like the regulations and like stuff like that. Like you'd think that I would have known that, but like, you know, sometimes love is a battlefield. Just being mm -hmm. honest, right? Mm -hmm. It's hard. I mean, uh so so I, I agree with you though. I agree with you. Like solo four one Ks are much, much better than as SCP IRAs. Like SCP IRAs is kind of like that like good enough boyfriend or girlfriend is, is, right? that, is like, that high school love when we're talking about true love right you know, like so. should i settle like it's okay like it works but like you know but like solo 401k is that like wow this is like the forever person but the problem is is yeah like you know you better still pay attention you better got to keep investing in that relationship otherwise like you might you might get just shocked one day i mean so um but i think too like thank you so much for taking out the q a i wanted to like say one more thing so like Y'all, all three, I see your like client satisfaction scores, like y'all rock, like you change people's lives and like the typical rate for, it's true though. It's really true. The typical rate for like the kind of service that you guys provide to clients, it's literally like $500 a month minimum. That's like the typical rate. And like, especially for profession specific planning, right? Cause you can get like $30 a month, like AI driven financial planning that they're going to tell you to put money in a Roth. And it's like, okay, great. Thanks. Like what else? So I think that that's the real like incredible value for the $99 a month is just like having profession specific advice. It's also specific to student loan borrowers. That's the other thing that you're not going to find anywhere else, right? Like all the other algorithms and pl planning firms are just not going to understand what y'all go through, what the people watching this are going through, right? Um, so I don't know. I think that that's like- I don't 
And I don't think you're exaggerating, Travis. At, at the previous firm I worked for, you would start pricing at five thousand, and that was just for very like bare bones planning. I mean, the pricing could go all the way up to ten or fifteen thousand, depending on how much you know as extra assistance you wanted. So I think what we're doing is actually like pretty revolutionary because we're trying to make financial planning accessible for everybody and not just people who can pay like a big price tag. Yeah, yeah but it, and like, I think. Go ahead, go ahead, Megan. Oh, I was gonna say there's uh. There's someone in the chat with my spelling, Megan, M-E-A-G-A-N. Um, I, I was telling, I was joking the other day, like I literally, I have two clients right now with the same spelling as me and I've never met another Megan that had the same spelling. And now you guys are popping up all over the place. So I guess I'm not all as unique Megan's. as I thought. <laughs> well, and, and too, we got a lot of SLP wealth clients on this webinar too. And we wouldn't say thank you because it is, it is a bear to try to do this. There's all these regulatory requirements. Like one time I got a call from like, like people, like regulatory people, like 7 a.m. in the morning and Sim, or Sim saved me and like took it over. I mean, like there's all these like huge expenses of running an RIA because all these, you know, just rules to protect investors, right? Uh, but it's also like really exhausting. And so every time you sign up, it's also investing in us trying to like spread this mission of helping people and transforming people's lives and getting people to where they deserve to be and helping people find true love in their finances, right? I mean, I don't know, like probably I should just chill. But, um, but I think the... So the, just to, uh, the, could you maybe y'all explain a little bit too with that, that slpwealth.com book link, what are like the two paths that that would take people down depending on if like they've worked with us before or they haven't, if you could just state that one more time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Good. No, you go. Say, if you <laughs> have not done a student loan plan with us before you will go down that route and you're going to get a, is it $200 discount Travis off of a student loan plan. So we'll get you set up there first, because again, we're doing student loan informed financial planning. You need a student loan plan first. Um, after the student loan plan, you will then meet with one of our financial planners. And if you are looking for a um, profession specific group, you will be routed to that group. If you have already done a student loan plan with us, then you can start right away. Um, you know, if you're a physician, if you're a dentist, you'll be routed to those groups. If you're working in a nonprofit, you'll be routed to Sam's group. If, um, you know, we don't have a profession specific offering for you yet, right? And well, we're, we're building this as we go. So we might offer your profession soon. Um, we need more people to sign up. And, uh, you know, if we have like a lot of pharmacists, we can have a pharmacist specific group, but that's, that's the path you're going to take. Mm -hmm. And I will say too, our, I, I do want to elaborate on our planning process. Cause I do think we, uh, by nature, I, th I feel like all of us are teachers in a way, like, and we do legitimately have career changers that were teachers in their past careers. So I think that's pretty cool because our goal is to really help you feel confident in your financial situation and your financial plans and what you're trying to do with your finances. Um, I think we're big believers in just helping you feel more and more confident with your situation versus just telling you what to do and then having you just do it. Like we, we like to be part of the process with you and part of the education um, so I, I think, uh, if you're someone who's newer to financial planning, if, if this stuff is, you know, stuff that you're really trying to learn now, the financial planning process is going to be super helpful to you because it's not going to be just general information thrown at you. It's going to be, Hey, this is your situation. This is why we're going to do it this way. And this is the impact that it's going to have to help you get towards your goals. So I think that's a good way to maybe explain our financial planning process as well as it, it is pretty educational and it's friendly for folks who are brand new to financial planning, um, just looking at this for the first time. Hey, Megan, can you put the QR code back on the screen for folks? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like it's a good, uh, just to have that partner to help you make decisions about things you wouldn't necessarily even like consider, right? Whether it's your cash flow, whether it's your retirement optimization, whether it's also investing, right? We had a handful of questions here because we told people in the process of the Roth backdoor, right, to convert their and then invest it, don't leave in cash. And some people are like, well, how do I invest it? Right. And so I, I don't know if uh, I'm not going to have Travis go down one of his like, uh, you know, our talks here on investing, which I know he would love to do. But Travis, <laughs> I would want you to if you could give like a minute kind of like spiel about like some of the considerations we take into not just necessarily investing into a Roth, but those three buckets, maybe. Right. And how that matters. Travis, talk about investing. It's like better than like a box of chocolate, Sam. Thank you so much. <laughs> I mean, by, by the way, we've, we're having like a lot of people looks like book today. So that's really cool. So we've got like a bunch of dentists in the dental group that just signed up, a couple of nurses. I got some nonprofit people. So like, it's, it's pretty exciting. So thank you all for believing in what we're doing. Uh, you know, that slpwealth.com slash book link. Well, again, we'll take you to the right place. I mean, so for the, 
the three buckets, like STEM, one thing that's like really exciting is like, I'm working with you, right? You're my, and Megan too, y'all two are my advisor for the SLP Wealth. And like the big thing that I realized is like, I don't really do a lot of things I'm supposed to do because I'm so busy and tired all the time. Like, Can I give an example? I have a great one for today is yeah. when you're looking at your stuff. You had a Roth IRA that was sitting in cash. Yeah. What? That's embarrassing. yeah. I've got. I've got to like. I've got to. I go, feel so uh, good that I discovered that. I was looking at stuff. I'm like, oh my god, Travis. I. I'm a, like you know. I'm. It's really hard to embarrass me like that, Sim, in front of hundreds of people. But you know, I'll take it. I mean, like hey, you know, we're the, not but perfect. The thing, but the thing is, is like you know, the the big. I think like when you're single, everybody believes that you can DIY without kids. Like if you're single without kids, right? Like real talk. Like I think everybody believes you can DIY your finances because they're simpler. But then you get married and then like you kind of need somebody kind of almost like as like the inner like the mediator between like two people's distinct dreams and goals and, and financial like priorities. So like my wife doesn't care about finances. The Roth IRA was under her login at Vanguard. And like, you know, I had to like get a text message for two factor authentication whenever I wanted to look at her account. And like, you know, it's like whenever I like would do the Roth contribution, like I would like settle it in cash because we would invest it later. I don't know. I probably should have invested it right away, but like, and then like I had to get my wife to like give me the key, the code to like log into her Vanguard account, like to invest it. And like, guess how important that was to her? <laughs> like not, not at all. Right. Like there's always something like way more important than like putting the Roth IRA money to work because she doesn't really care about personal finances. Like she cares about surgery and like, that's what her priorities are in life. And so like, that's how it ended up in cash for years. <laughs> actually, the same thing happened in my HSA. Like, and that was actually totally on me, Sim. <laughs> it was just like, I mean, you know, to defend myself, like, you know, that was, you know, we're I'm blessed. That was a portion of assets, right? So it wasn't like it was like the priority for me to like get that money to work. But yeah, I just did just, uh, it just, I just, it slipped my mind. But like about those three buckets though, like I don't, I think people don't understand how transformational it is to like do tax loss harvesting within your brokerage account, right? To build up a bunch of losses that you can use to offset gains and future assets. Like that's an, an along the way thing you have to do to be able to write off hundreds of thousands of dollars potentially in gains later in life. You know, the Roth stuff, you know, that's, it takes a long time to build that up with a bunch of backdoor contributions. And if you're married filing separate because you're student loans, you might have 20 years worth of backdoor Roth stuff to do. And do you really want to do that on your on your own and not get any reminders? Like Sim, you just gave me some reminder, like the text message reminder uh, to do my like, cash flow budget worksheet for our next meeting and like I'm dreading it because I don't know what it looks like and I'm scared because like I follow obviously my spending but like not as well as I should and so like <laughs> it's just like uh it's it's like the accountability is really great and then like for the um the pre-tax like bucket right the pre-tax uh, 401k thing so like you're either going to be rich or you're not if you're not rich you're going to be in a lower tax bracket in retirement and having a bunch of pre-tax assets will be wonderful and then you can optimize the withdrawals for those to make sure that all the withdrawals are in like the 12% tax bracket instead of the 22% tax bracket, right? So like that'll be a big opportunity. And then I just learned about this. So this is another really embarrassing thing. So maybe this was like the embarrassing Travis day, but like, you know, when you pull out RMDs, right? If you're charitably inclined, Sam, I think what can you do? It's up to $100,000 to charity. Or is that, is that easy, right? I think it's 100,000, right? Yeah, it's hundred thousand. It's like a qualified. What is it called? A qualified charity. Qualified distribution. charitable distribution QCD. Yeah. So if you have like millions of dollars in a pre-tax, you know, and you have more than enough to live off of. Well, now you can take like a hundred k a year of your out of your R and D and like write off the entire thing and like not pay any tax on it. So you didn't pay any tax contributing. You didn't pay any tax along the way to grow it, and then you pay like no tax when you're contributing it to charity. And so what a wonderful like way to like. I don't know, just live life. Like if you have a bunch of money, you don't even need, right? So there's all these like strategies on strategies on strategies that y'all are talking about today. And like Roth, I feel like it's like how to deal with like one relationship, but like you've got all these ones that I don't know, I should be, I should shut up. But, like, I, think, you, I think Travis just like kind of really hit the point, like maybe not even intentionally is like personal, it's all integrated. They're all connected, right? Like one contribution links to the other, Diversify, diversifying your income with those three buckets in retirement, diversifying the assets within those three buckets to make sure that they're optimized for your tax situation in retirement. And that all lines with retirement optimization. So you just saw right there how investing retirement and uh, taxes are all connected, right? And so that's why it's so helpful for us. Like we love having kind of working for a firm that where we can do everything from student loans to financial planning to tax planning, right? Um, the perfect ecosystem is what we're working on.
Man, guys, we got through 70 questions. I don't know how we did it, but we did. <laughs> I don't even think Scotty was supposed to be in this like webinar, but he's like helping out with all these questions. So I love it. I guess he <laughs> also loves Roth IRA. That's amazing. <laughs> yes. mm -hmm. Scotty, I see you. Appreciate you. <laughs> you know, we didn't talk about, and I'll kind of, maybe we should end here, but it's Valentine's Day. And so if you don't even care about strategy, I mean, financial planning can just be a way to like preserve the harmony in your relationship. If you and your spouse either like argue about finances or just like can't seem to communicate about them. Um, Megan, and I did a podcast yesterday and we were talking about how, you know, divorce is very expensive. And so nurture your relationship, like buy, buy your significant other, you know, flowers or whatever they like, like show some kind of appreciation and that can in and of itself pay dividends. Could I do one more spreadsheet or is that like just oh my God. really overpowering? <laughs> Go for yeah, it, Travis. Will, but, you know, his love. Go, go ahead. We'll personally right. enjoy it. I can't speak for the audience. All right. So I'm just going to pretend for a moment like that somebody's got a hundred thousand dollar portfolio. Okay. And then, all right. So this is like portfolio size. All right. This is a really complicated spreadsheet. So buckle up. All right. So what is like the typical like percent chance of divorce like in America? Would you say? Why are we talking about that on Valentine's Day, guys? I know. Well, divorce, this is, let's go with a. a late, because we're going to keep people together. We're going to keep let's people still, together. Let's say the, the divorce rate has dropped. Let's say it's about 40% or so. All right, 40%. And then in a divorce, your assets get split in half, right? And we're going to talk later about these, how you know these stats, but okay. All right. So there's, so the, so the expected, well, like that's like the total probability, like cumulatively, right? So what's the probability in any given year, would you say? Like 3% or 4%, like in any given year? Sure. For the sake of illustration, why not? All right, so 0.03. So that means. Travis, can you zoom in on the spreadsheet for the people asking? Sure. I'll I'll, I'll just I'll just make it simple, right? <laughs> this is so sorry, guys. It's Valentine's Day. What what are you doing, Travis? You're killing us. All right, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say this, right? So 40% chance of divorce. Say you've got a hundred thousand dollar portfolio, and you know you lose half when you when that happens. So it's like okay, so 50% loss. 40% chance of divorce, money is like one of the most common like reasons people split up, right? So that's like expected value risk, value at risk. And that's if you use like a financial term, like 20 grand. What if you reduce that probability of divorce just a little bit, just by talking about your money goals, having it outlined, like working together towards those goals? You know, if you're being, if you're charged five, $10,000 a year, like maybe that's not like that great of an investment, whatever. But like, if it's pretty cheap, that's my main point. I just, I, I should, 